Hey, everybody, this is Harvey Sluggo Wasserman with the 160-something, I don't remember, Green Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Zoom call. Glad to have you all with us. <clears throat> we are a podcasting, broadcasting, webcasting, flycasting, whatever you want to call it, at 2 p.m. Pacific time, 5 p.m. Eastern time. We got a full boat, as we always do, tons of t- stuff to talk about. In the second hour today, we're going to be, well, we're already joined by the great Dr. Nancy Naparco in the second hour, starting at 6 p.m. Eastern time and 3 p.m. Pacific. We're going to talk about uh, national health care, single payer. Nancy's going to give us a uh, uh, a presentation, which we've been waiting for for quite a while. And then we're going to be joined by the great Jerry Ashton, who uh, is doing a, a truly a remarkable, we've had him with this before, an amazing campaign to re- retire medical debt where his organization buys up a medical debt at a small percentage of its original whatever and, and pays it off. And he's going to tell us that uh, we have two states now, New Jersey and Connecticut, that are racing to be the first to pay off all the medical debt in their states, which is truly amazing and uh, really would be a, a tremendous a benefit to everybody in the country and certainly in those states. In the first hour... We uh, we did originally have Keith Ellison uh, scheduled for the second time, and for the second time he's canceled, which is fine. We got a ton of t- ton of stuff to talk about. We're going to start off with t- Taylor Swift and the Super Bowl. Uh, I wouldn't be doing this except that it has become extremely political thanks to Donald Trump. I mean, uh, what kind of idiot attacks the most popular pop performer? in the country, if not the world, but he has managed to do it. And it could be, could actually decide the election. So I want to talk about that. I got some sports fans, including uh, Tatanka, who, uh, like me, watched the whole Super Bowl. We're also going to talk about <laughs> two amazing indictments that have come down in Ohio. This is a very big deal. The, the former president of the biggest utility company in Ohio, First Energy, and the former chairman, chairperson, of the Ohio Public Utilities Commission have been indicted, federally indicted. This is a really big deal in a $60 million bribery case. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to go to Wendy Lederman uh, in Florida to talk about Ron DeSantis and the developing um, fascist state down there, which is truly amazing. I do want to acknowledge that it is Black History Month. I once saw Dick Gregory uh, point out that uh, for Black History Month, They chose February, the shortest month. But um, here we are. There's a lot to uh, deal with uh, on that reality. We've been joined by Joel Siegel, by by the way. Great to see you, Joel. And um, we really have a a full boat. We're also going to talk some more about renewable energy and um, the massive attack on renewables, which is truly astounding. Um, You know, you would have thought that solar energy would be uh, like mom and apple pie. Uh, beyond the ability uh, or reason, any reason to attack it, but massive assault uh, on renewable energy going on, which really needs to be discussed, as does uh, the homeless situation. But uh, let's get uh, let's get right to it. Uh, the Super Bowl, I believe. Oh, uh, we did want to. I do want to um, quickly give Myla Reese in a minute. We do have a job announcement. Um, Pacifica, uh, the Pacifica Network. The radio network, which I think should become a media network, um, is holding a, um, has issued a job description for uh, conducting an election that's coming up. Uh, we will have new elections at Pacifica, and there is a job available to run these elections. And uh, Myla, do you want to tell us about it and post the link in the chat for the job description? Oh, thank you, Harvey. And one other thing. Um... We're coming up on the 10th anniversary of the failure of the um, dump for plutonium contaminated nuclear weapons waste in southern New Mexico um, to isolate the plutonium from the accessible environment. The dump failed uh, 9,985 years ahead of schedule, the waste isolation pilot plant. And uh, later in the show, uh, I'd like to talk to you about that as well. But right now, I want to talk about the... um, the opening for a national election supervisor for the Pacifica Foundation. Pacifica will be uh, conducting elections this year for the five sister 
Pacifica stations, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK, where you and I are, Harvey, in uh, Los Angeles, KPFK in Los Angeles, KPFT in Houston, WPFW in Washington, D.C., and WBAI in, uh, in New York City will all be conducting elections for to replace half of their local station board. So they will be electing um, nine uh, delegates or uh, for the local station board, and Pacifica has an opening for uh, uh, somebody with experience conducting elections to oversee, oversee the um, these delegate elections for all five stations. So it's a big job, and they hope to name someone by the end of March. And uh, if you go to pacifica.org, the job should be posted there, the job description. And if you want more information about uh, and, and think that you might be able to apply for the job, which is a complicated job, which may, in fact, be divided into se separate parts. But um, for now, um, we just want to let people know that we have a, a, a time crunch here and we're hoping to find somebody who is willing to oversee these elections for the uh, twenty. For this year 2024 so if you go to pacifica.org i will put the um the link in the chat i'm going to find it and um and thank you uh hoping we're really hoping to find someone who can oversee all of these kind of complicated elections. can't hear you muted, harvey. muted harvey i believe the uh, uh the job pays around 40 grand so um this is not an insubstantial for for you know just a few months work so um, um, it's it's a, a serious job offer, uh, Ray. If you know someone or, or, or uh, Tatanka with experience running elections, um, this is something to look into. Uh, it is a substantial, serious job. Okay, um, and you'll uh, uh, and it's a big deal. That these elections at Pacifica <clears throat> really matter. I mean, I'm pretty pleased to announce that uh, you know Pacifica has been in dire straits for three years now after a an election was denied and uh, it just completely wrecked uh, much of the network. And we're just finally getting back up on our feet. We're hoping that this year we can turn Pacifica around and make it into a really major voice for the progressive movement in this country. And these elections are, are critical to it. So um, uh, take a look at the description. I'm going to send a copy to um, uh, Ray Lutz, who has tremendous expertise. But if you know anybody who wants a job, uh, running an election, um, we, we are taking up where well, the network is uh, taking. The executive director, Stephanie Wells, will take uh, um, uh, your application. Amila? Yeah, Harvey, I, I just looked at uh, Pacifica.org. I'm sorry, I just got home and, and um, uh, it looks like the job hasn't been posted. We were promised that it would be posted today. So, right. so uh, keep looking at this. And if you. Uh, you can contact me um, or Harvey, and um, and we'll get the information to you right now. Um, I'm posting a link to the jobs page on Pacifica.org, and unfortunately, it has it has yet to be posted. But we're we're expecting it up today. Hey. Thank you. Mute it again, uh, Harvey. <laughs> <clears throat> Somebody at the door here. <laughs> Always happens. Um, I want to welcome Michael Zweig. Michael, um, are, are you the Michael Zweig that went to the University of Michigan way back when? I am the very one, and you are the very Harvey Wasserman. Hello there. I am indeed. So Michael Zweig and I have not seen each other for a good 50 years. <laughs> but here we are. And I see and Michael was a, a mentor in, in, to a lot of us at the University of Michigan in the 60s uh, on radical economics and um uh michael it's great really amazing to see you i'm I'm glad uh we also had carl oglesby turn up on our on our uh, show here so it's that's really very great. good that's very good i see joel siegel is on the call too an old friend uh that's done some things and if you want to check out democracy now this morning i was on with uh reverend barber for uh, the last segment oh. of democracy now today so and what did you talk about we talked about uh, what the Poor People's Campaign is doing and what my new book is, uh, Class, Race, and Gender, Challenging the Injuries and Divisions of Capitalism. That's just out from PM Press. And uh, so, so Amy had me on with uh, a Reverend Barber who wrote the foreword to the book. 
uh, to talk about what's going on with the Poor People's Campaign and with the whole idea of fusion politics. And it's what the Progressive Caucus does, what the what PDA has been doing for years and years. Well, so I'll tell you what, Michael, um, this is really cool. Michael was a huge uh, force at the U of M uh, back in the day. And um, if you'll get Reverend Barber and Joel, join Joel, we'll have you on next week and we'll give you a full uh, 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 a slot to talk about this. You want to do that? That's great. I can uh, check with uh, Reverend Barber and see if he's available. It would be at this time. Yes. And, yeah, this time. and how should I characterize what this is exactly uh, so that he can uh, uh, know what he's getting into? Um, we, we have a great group of people here. Right now we have 32. Uh, this is webcast. It's rebroadcast. I mean, livecast. It's rebroadcast on the Progressive Radio Network on Thursday nights, and it's archived at the um, uh, Greep site. So uh, you know it goes around, and we uh, we're really we really have a good session with you. You were uh, extremely charismatic and very coherent. You made a lot of big difference back in uh, back in the day. So we, we, ha, have us on next week. Join us next week. Let me know. Uh, my sure. email is solartopia at gmail s o l a r t o p i a at gmail dot com and um, uh, Michael, it's it's really great to see you and come back with Joel. Maybe we'll get Carl uh, Oglesby to join you and talk about the early days of SDS. That, that would be cool. a hoot. Uh, and, be- uh, let me, what, what's Joel's uh, current email? I was just going to put it in the chat. I don't want to bother everybody here. Uh, Joel's uh, on the on there. He, he, or uh, yes, email so me I'll, and I'll get it to you. Okay. Uh, uh, very good. And uh, okay, I'll I'll see what I can do. I, I'm not sure I'm available, but we'll figure something out. I'll be in touch. Well, it doesn't have to be next week. Just find yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. That, that's a very kind offer. Thank you very much. And, and hello, sure, everybody. Thank you. Uh, go, let's go get them. All right. Well, speaking of going to get them, we have Ray McClendon on. Ray is one of the truly great organizers of grassroots campaigning. And we also have Camilla Reese with us. Uh, so uh, we, we want to get to the one thing that we know everybody wants to talk about, <laughs> which is yesterday's Super Bowl. And the, the reason um, we really want to talk about it is that Donald Trump uh, uh, has uh, in, incredibly stupidly continued to attack uh, Taylor Swift. I mean, if there's any one person that a, a, a sane politician would not want to attack in this country right now, it's Taylor Swift. And um, she um, apparently has like a a hundred million followers on her, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, but the bottom line is that um, uh, her team won, and it was a great game. Uh, Ray McClendon, uh, I got to ask you the most important question I can ask you today, which is, did you watch the game? And what did you think? <laughs> yeah, I watched the game and and uh, to, uh, was delighted by the outcome, especially knowing that it it hurt so many of the MAGA crowd. Uh, as we talked about uh, on the, one of our Thursday calls, it, it was amazing how the Maggots could contort themselves into being for a team from one of the most uh, <laughs> liberal, prog- progressive bastions in all of America. They were going to support Nancy Pelosi and, and Kamala Harris. Yeah, really. <laughs> I mean, talk, talk about being between the rocks. The rock in a hard place. No, exactly. You know? and I got to tell you, I warmed up for the game by watching a session, which you all might, I found it absolutely fascinating. Taylor Swift, uh, I don't know, five, six years ago, she draws huge crowds. I mean, I don't get, you know, she seems like nice. I don't get her music. But, um, you know, she had a stadium filled and she brought on Mick Jagger. And, you know, this was like, holy cow, man. This is, uh, uh, it, it was I just recommend Google Mick Jagger with singing with Taylor Swift. And and you tell me what you thought of it. I, I just found it amazing. I did I did also, I want to talk to Tatanka. I just saw um, a statistic that said that a quarter, 25% of the people who watch the Super Bowl watch it for the commercials. I, I know my son-in-law does. I mean, he doesn't care anything about football. But every year he goes to this place and they all sit in what, four hours, for God's sakes. And, and I have to tell you, I, I had a personal crisis during this Super Bowl because I set myself up exactly the way I wanted. I went to 24-hour fitness and I got on the exercise bike. And, and I biked all the way through the first half. And then I wasn't interested in the halftime show with Usher. So I went and I worked out, lifted weights for like 40 minutes. Came back and missed a piece of the first, second half, 
and I'm on the exercise bike, and I, I timed it perfectly to finish my workout. My workout when the game ended, and it went into Super Bowl, and I, I mean into uh, um, uh, overtime. And I was dying on the bike, man. But uh, you know, I got through it. Um, uh, t- um, uh, Tatanka Bricka, uh, what did you think of the game? Well, first of all, I wanted to say about the ads. You know, it was the 1984 Super Bowl that kicked off all the ad mania. Right. That's when Apple came on with the Mac with the Big Brother ad, just classic. You know, put it on the put it on the map. Um, well, and I'll just a, a comment, just a comment about the whole the whole. Uh, brouhaha with with uh, Mr. Orange Hair and uh, Taylor Swift. You know, I mean, what really triggered him was the fact that Taylor Swift stands in front of a crowd of people and urges them to vote. She doesn't even say who to vote for. It's a completely nonpartisan urging people to vote. And of course, that is a perfect statement about what would trigger the GOP, the the minority extremist MAGA cult. If we vote, they lose. So he today, I mean, I didn't have time to look at it, but he called trade uh Taylor Smith traitorous <laughs> for urging yeah. people to vote. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's truly amazing. I so, did uh, <clears throat> there was one commercial. I don't know how many of you watch this thing. That I I, I know Ray, you, you probably saw this. Uh there was a commercial about Jesus, or two of them. A commercial is about Jesus. And I couldn't make heads or tails of what they were trying to say. Uh, the first commercial had him wash. And these commercials, by the way, are $7 million. It's $7 30 million. Sec- 30, 30 seconds. seconds <laughs> for 30 seconds. And this commercial, and, you know, I, I've gone back and watched a lot of them. And this one, I, I couldn't figure out what they were trying to do. There was a commercial show, showing Jesus washing people's feet. And it made no sense to me. Can you? Can anybody figure this out? And there was one instance where <clears throat> Jesus was washing, or somebody was washing people's feet in front of a woman's health clinic. And I thought this must be a progressive message that Jesus loves everybody, even people who have gone in for an abortion. <laughs> but apparently, the, the the commercial was funded by an extreme right wing group, and didn't make any sense. Did anybody figure that one out? No, no I, I couldn't do it. Okay, uh, a lot of you, I, I will apparently didn't watch. I'm going to say a couple more things very quickly about football. First of all, this is the one, one of the uh, the only remaining football team that has an indigenous-based nickname, which is the Chiefs, and they've you know they've taken a lot of flack for it. They do the tomahawk chalk, but talk, but or tomahawk chop, but so far uh, they haven't removed it. Um, uh, and I also want to say that Trump, act, although he's still attacking Taylor Swift, did suck up to uh, Travis Kelsey. So for those of you who don't know, Travis Kelsey is um, uh, a major football player. He's a really great football player um, and will be in the Hall of Fame. And he's from Cleveland, and he's very personable and clearly extremely intelligent. <clears throat> and um, I saw him hosting uh, Saturday Night Live. And he was really good. So afterwards, Trump has said that he wanted to congratulate Travis Kelsey, uh, even though Travis probably hates me, according to Donald Trump. Uh, so I don't know where that's going, but it'll be interesting to follow. Wendy. Oh, the other thing before, Wendy, um, the, it's very important to understand about the NFL that this is the biggest sports deal in the country now. And they signed a um, a deal uh, based on a lawsuit on concussions. And as you, all of you know, I'm sure that football players just get their heads banged. And they're, they're, the concussions and the CTE, um, the, the disease that comes from too many concussions, is rampant among football players. And there's a very important movie, actually a very good movie, starring Will Smith called Concussion, where he portrays the, a Nigerian doctor who came to the United States in, in Pittsburgh, and he took up with a guy who had been a great football player and was now living in his car, this guy. I don't remember his name. And he isolated the reality of, of concussion. And the, the, the NFL signed a multi-billion dollar, multi-million dollar, might have been a multi-billion dollar deal to compensate the, the players, and they've reneged on it. I mean, these, these shysters, these billionaires 
with all this money from the from the Super Bowl, and I mean they made a fortune in the Super Bowl. God knows how much they made, and and they've all got tons of money, and they're they're refusing to pay these guys. Uh, it's just sick, beyond sick. And there's also a racial aspect. Wendy, is that what you wanted to talk about about the racial um, aspect? I- Thank, thank you. I had um two quick little points about the Super Bowl, but I was going to say something right, ahead, about please. it when you're finished. Yeah, thank yeah. you. So, um sorry. Thank you. Sorry about like 30 seconds of um background noise per second. Um so I just heard I think it was earlier today or yesterday. There's a historian that I follow um on Instagram called Ernest Krem. He goes by Mr. Krem and he talks about um like the real black history and a lot of um true African um stories that aren't told. And um, he was talking about how um, when the first liability um, suits came out against the concussions in the paperwork, it actually stated that the black players would get less money um, in compensation because they basically are losing less cognitive function. So basically just saying that, um, I mean, you, you get the point of what that says. And it's it's just really messed up. And it's like still in there. So I'm going to reach out to him and see if I can get that guy to come on. Or if not, I'll look more into it and report more in the future. But it's like just the deep-seated racism. I mean, these kids are puppets. And then you're talking about the money, like thinking about how much money comes in from the military. So it, to me, it's like an extension of like high school recruitment. Um, I, I, the, the two points if i if i may really really quickly um about the super bowl i wanted to make one is um about taylor swift the, and the irony that um ray kind of mentioned about um the flip flop of like who wait which side am i on um so taylor swift has been getting so much flack because of her two private jets that she's known for taking trips that are like a half an hour away and she's using like in like a day fossil fuels that 500 will use an entire year and so the people shaming her are like now having to inadvertently admit that fossil fuels are a problem but it did drive her to sell one of her jets but like all these people like they're like the the truck diesel guzzling people are like oh but she's burning all these fossil fuels so so you admit they're bad so let's have let's continue this conversation on a more enlightened level after the game right and the one other point that i wanted to make really quickly um that i thought of so i heard that israel actually funded some ads and i haven't seen them so i don't know what they are i don't know if they're the same ones that harvey was referring to or not um but i did hear that there was a lot of money pumped in from israel that um is to basically somehow um promote what they're doing and i did want to say that during the super bowl while everyone was watching it um rafa was bombarded But Rafa is the southernmost city where now 1.6 million people are sheltering. It's normally 300,000, I think, people. And so you have everybody was forced. This is the only safe zone left. Okay. So all the people in Gaza and 109 people were killed in like one hour while we were watching. So um, I just wanted to keep some perspective on that as well. So thank you. I know that probably wasn't expected. (laughs) Thank thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that, Wendy. Uh, Tatanka, go ahead. (laughs) Tatanka, you're muted. Hold on. Okay, there you go. Just want, thank you. I just wanted to mention that of all the professional sports, it was the NFL that actually organized as a union. I believe it was 54, two years before, uh, uh, or the NBA, I guess, was the first. And then the the NFL and uh, came on later. Um, and I, I believe it was the Packers and the Browns. I think they were the first ones to really start getting together as a union organizing. So, Everybody knows that the professional sports players make a lot of money. But when I grew up, you know, the with the 49ers and the Rams, I mean, they had to take they had to take jobs all year round. It wasn't organized at all. It was no way to make money in professional football. So it was the union that straightened that out. And uh, I think you could probably say that the NBA that uh, racially organized first um uh, is the most progressive, yeah, then the NFL, then baseball, you know. So it's just worth noting that I, I think Donald Trump has has problems with anybody that's organized, right? Because people get to yeah, speak, yeah. they get to speak their mind and, and have agency in what they do. Well it's important that the uh the, the NFL uh players players union is very powerful. And uh they they have been really uh, uh an important force in, in organized labor. Um, and this this concussion fight is going to be a big deal. 
And, uh, yeah. I, you know, I'm firmly of the belief that uh, O.J. Simpson's behavior uh, was linked to, you know, he started running the ball probably in elementary school, certainly in junior high. I mean, this guy was hit in the head probably 10,000 times. So, you know, it, it's important we uh, uh, recognize this. Uh, is there anyone else who wants to jump in? This is There was a very funny sketch on SNL, uh, all these guys standing around talking about wondering what they're going to do with their lives now that the uh, football season is over. So uh, uh, any of you sports fans want to uh, vent very quickly, then we're going to go to these indictments in Ohio. And then Ron DeSantis, second hour, we're going to deal with health care. Justin, uh, did you want to say something? Justin LeBlanc, go ahead. Are you muted? Yeah. So the, the other part of this saga with Trump is that recently he came out saying that Bud Light, the same group that uh, his stands have been uh, telling to boycott, Donald Trump said instead, we'll give him a second chance. Why? Because his son-in-law is actually big in money with Bud Light and has been for a long time. So, yeah, even Donald Trump can't uh, ignore the money. That's the bottom line for him and his promotion <laughs> aspects. Right. But, of course. Uh, he, the other yeah. part about all of this, uh, as far as like NFL sports, and uh, you mentioned the, the ad for the foot washing. So I looked that up, and that is... We uh, he he gets us is the right, group, right. and they are actually the media arm for the No Labels Party, which is a bunch of right wing Republicans such as Hobby Lobby guy uh, that are offset by uh, nice Democrats such as Joe Manchin. <laughs> well, I, I couldn't figure out the ad. I, I, I urge people watch the ad. Go, they're all available now on the online somewhere. And if you can, you know, Jesus foot washing. Super Bowl. <clears throat> I couldn't figure it out. I the mean, the idea behind all of that is to, you know, don't have any judgment for anybody, including politicians. We're all just doing the best job we can. And really, that's just a uh, stalking horse or a, a Trojan horse for, hey, you know, uh, let, let's continue to have guys like Joe Manchin and Mitch McConnell continue to uh, turn our country over to oligarchs. You know, the, no no judgment about Medicare for all or any of the other things that people might actually want. Speaking of things right. people want, we have Jerry Ashton. Um, he's only available for about 25 minutes. So it'd be great if we could get to him pretty soon, Sluggo. Well, I think we can have him afterwards. He's going to be on PDA for a while and then we can have him in the second hour. No, we can't. He's only going to be here for like 25 minutes. He just put it in uh, the chat. Yeah. All right. All right. So listen, uh, I guess, well, Ray, is there any other, any other football fans want to jump in and comment on uh, uh, on the Super Bowl? Forever hold your peace because we're when, not going to talk football probably for another uh, uh, till next year. Tatanka, to to go ahead. Yeah, one, one more thing. It, it's, it go, I haven't heard anybody talk about it, but Patrick Mahomes is one of the first who did – community organizing to get people voting in his local community. And, of course, he won't go after Patrick Mahomes, but he'll go after a powerful woman. Well, uh, you know, again, if Taylor Swift comes out, I don't care if she endorses Biden or not, really. But if she urges people to vote, um, that could change the election. And uh, I have seen Travis Kelsey uh, on TV. I, if you're interested, just Google uh, Travis Kelsey on SNL. He's incredibly charming and clearly very smart. So uh, this is a big deal. And uh, I'm just glad the Chiefs won. <clears throat> and um, um, uh, Ray, did you want to jump in? I know uh, the Falcons uh, uh, suffered major humiliation in the last Super Bowl they were in, but maybe we can ride all that. But you're, the, uh, you're, you're focusing on, uh, uh, as much as anyone, on, and Camilla, on election turnout. So hopefully uh, this is going to play into our, our agenda. Zach, you want to say anything about that before we go to Jerry Ashton and medical care? Ray, you with us there? I see your picture. Let's see if you're unmuted. Hattie's got her hand up. Uh, Hattie, did you want to say something? Hattie Tripp? Unmute, yes. Oh, just a statement that, uh, you know, Super Bowl is made of super black athletes and the uh, Super Bowl is owned by mainly non-black owners. And I think that's... Uh, that's something that we have to consider in terms of the racism within the sports history. Absolutely. Uh, the NBA is the same way, although the NBA is changing faster than the, than the um, NFL. But 
I remember that um, uh, Patrick Mahomes, whose father is black, um, was uh, paid $450 million by the Chiefs. Uh, so maybe he can buy the team at some point. Uh, that would be really great. Uh, a good point there. Okay, uh, we're, we're bouncing around with our schedule today. So we will uh, discuss in the second hour uh, Ron DeSantis and um, uh, the uh, indictments in Ohio. Jerry Ashton has rescheduled for us to talk about medical debt, and then we'll go from him to Nancy Naparco to talk about uh, national health care. So, and, and I know, I think Joel Siegel is with us. We do have 46 people with us. Uh, Jerry, you want to uh, jump in here and, and give us the wrap on on uh, 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 reducing medical debt? Sure well, first of all, let me thank you for allowing me to be in this illustrious group again. I had a You're great welcome. time last had a great time the last time I was here, time I was here. I think I told you then we'd abolished um, uh, $9 billion with the medical debt, my charity called RIP Medical Debt. We'd abolished $9 billion worth of medical debt, and your response was, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> so well, hopefully I'll get more thoughts. I loved your watts. <laughs> so maybe I'm going to tell you that we're closer to $11 billion right now. And that's for so over $7 exactly. million. Tell us exactly how it works, what you do. Again, okay. it's been a few months. And you have okay. you have two states now that are up, uh, on the brink of abolishing all their medical debt. That's astounding. Well, there are so many wonderful things happening in our world, considering our world del- deals with the bleak reality that any one of us watching and listening today are one illness and one accident away from irreparable harm financially thanks to our broken medical system, which is not a medical system. So when I, to give you the, the history on this, I'm a former debt collector. And I, uh, <laughs> 10 years ago, I walked into Occupy Wall Street uh, because I live in New York. I'm a former Navy journalist and I had a camera and I had a pad, a paper and a pen. I thought I would document what was going on. So I went down to Occupy Wall Street and uh what they had to say resonated. Now, one of these in particular, and I'm a debt collector, one of these was the absolutely horror show that any American can go bankrupt just because they got sick or hurt. Well, that resonated with me. And so when they discovered that they had a bill collector in their midst, they decided to put me to work. And I and uh, my partner, Craig Antico, were recruited to be the back room, the back office for the Rolling Jubilee. The Rolling Jubilee was put on by Occupy Wall Street uh, as a way of bringing attention to the fact that your medical debt can be bought and sold like ham hocks uh, on the open market. Well, um, so I proceeded to help them uh, buy the debt. Uh, We would see that they would see that the debt was forgiven. They were 501c4. And then Craig and I would use our collection software and instead of sending out uh, collection letters, we'd simply send out forgiveness letters. So when Occupy began to dissipate, uh, they came up to us one day and said that they were going to work on something, going to go in a different direction. You've heard that before. Uh, but it was a good direction. They were going to go after student debt. And Craig and I looked at each other and we said, we can't let, can't let this happen. So we formed RIP Medical Debt in January 2014. And from that point forward, uh, two former debt collectors turn into debt forgivers, and um, we know a lot about what's going on, and I guess that's why Harvey's invited me. So, Harvey, <laughs> questions? Well, did Jesus wash your feet while you were... Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> well, no, this is this is quite amazing. My understanding of what you do, and we want to keep having you back, is this is a, uh, you know, $11 billion in medical debt retired. How many people that have you seen? Saved from bankruptcy? Um, well, I'm, I can't tell you that we've saved people from bankruptcy, uh, which, by the way, I suggest is a, a very intelligent way out if you're underwater with debt that you can't pay. Stop being noble about carrying that burden uh, and do what smart people do. Get out from under it because you shouldn't have that debt to begin with. So if you're talking about medical debt, um, my my take on all this over the last 10 years of working with physician groups, working with hospitals, working with healthcare providers, <clears throat> you have to realize that 
the system is set up the way that it is because it's profitable. <laughs> I don't have to tell this group that. Uh, and it's broken to good effect. And trying to change that system is not that easy. I'll give you a couple riffs on that in a, in a few minutes. But what you were referring to, Harvey, is that we've gotten to the point right so far, we're so well known and so effective at what we do that we have hospitals come to us to see whether or not we could buy their debt for pennies on the dollar and forgive it to get off their backs and off their books and, you know, do a nice community philanthropic thing. Well, you have now, you have, and this is put in the chat, you have the state of Connecticut and the state of New Jersey vying to work with you to retire all their medical debt. Can you tell us about that and how it would work? I mean, this okay. is a huge deal. It is a big deal, a BFD. Well, it all, it was sort of ignited by New York City. New York City has been in conversation with us. They discovered, I mean, we're in their neighborhood, you know, but they discovered that right here in New York City, there was a tiny organization that grew up to be a big one whose basic function was to take medical debt off, off of people's backs. And as a charity, that means people give me money. I go to the debt market. I buy their debt. When I get that debt in my possession, I slit his throat. Some people call that forgiveness, but I get rid of it. Now, New York City announced to everybody maybe two weeks ago that they were working with RIP medical debt at the rate of $18 million a year for the next three years to abolish the debt for every citizen in New York City who qualified on the basis of being a charitable need. Now, that means they will have abolished $2 billion for, let's see, oh, yes, uh, 500,000 people. That's my, So someone in the chat here, Ira Denver, says you're paying about a half cent on the dollar. Is that about right? Yes, pretty much. Um, so what you do is this... you take outstanding medical debt that's uncollectible or uncollected, and you offer the... Um, owner of that debt, a half cent on the dollar. Is that right? Close. It used to be that we could buy the debt for a half a cent on the dollar because it was older debt, therefore uncollectible. Now what we're doing is we're going to the hospitals. We say, look, let us take your debt portfolio. Let us run it through our analytics. And we will locate those people who are four times the poverty level or below we will locate those people who are paying 5% or more out of pocket for health care, and we will buy that debt from you. Some of that debt could be a month old, two months, six months, a year, which is in the collections industry, the debt buyers and the, and the bill collectors that chase after that debt, this is, this is prime mistake. But by going directly to the hospital, we negotiate a price that would be considered um, industry specific. In other words, if it's an earlier debt, we have to pay more. Sometimes we might pay three, four, five cents on the dollar. But we still manage somehow with uh, the monies that we have to be able to keep it in that roughly every dollar is $100, $10,000 equals a million. It's astounding. Uh, will you put your links in the chat? Are there anybody else? Is there anybody else out there doing this? Are you the only operation that's really doing this? <laughs> Funny you should ask. Uh, when I started RIP Medical Debt, uh, along the way, I discovered that veterans were showing up in our portfolios. We buy portfolios of million dollars at a time, and they would show up. And I'm saying to myself, and I'm a former veteran as well, I'm saying to myself, hi there. <laughs> I'm saying to myself, why is a veteran having to have medical debt forgiven? And what I discovered is that veterans, <laughs> through the VA, either through the VA or they owe the VA as much as $6 billion. The VA? I repeat that? Yes. The VA Thank you holds for $6 billion on debt on veterans? This is where you say, what? That's insane. So yes, vet veterans is. are being held to pay the VA for their medical care? Well, they, they can't exactly hold it to uh, hold a... You either have the money or you don't. So what happens is if a debt is accrued that is owed to the VA by a veteran, they're in debt and they'll be collected on, just like just like a hospital would collect on you and me. If I had no idea that the, vet, the VA 
was billing veterans for health care. That makes no sense at all. Well, wow. and Nancy and Parker is going to talk about this in a while, but that, that makes the VA bills veterans for their health care. Are you kidding me? No, no. Understand how the VA works. It's discretionary. What most people, and I wasn't even aware of it, is that your medical debt will be covered as a veteran, providing you jump through this hoop, this hoop, this hoop, and this hoop. It has to be, in all cases, it has to be military service connected. Now, let me tell you two incidents incidents in which the VA ignored debt that was caused by military service. Number one, through Agent Orange. They fought oh, yeah. veterans tooth and nail who had Agent Orange who were dying. But they say, you know, there's no correlation. There's no proof, blah, 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 until finally there was such an uproar and people proved the case that the VA started covering that. Then along comes the patron saint of, of um, veterans. And that patron saint is John Stewart. By the way, he's going to wow. be on tonight. I'm going to catch his show. John Stewart is the one who came forth to help veterans fight the VA about another little problem right. called burn pits. If you guys aren't familiar with that, when you're serving uh, overseas and you're in a war zone, everything that you have uh, that can be that if you're leaving the area or or you might be living, it goes into a burn pit. All the old files, all the chemicals, all the munitions go into a burn pit. And that smoke that comes out of the burn pit infects the lungs of the persons, not only who are attending the burn pit, but the entire area. And these people had been arguing with the VA about the fact that their respiratory diseases, their cancers were caused when they were on duty, on in service. And it wasn't if it wasn't for John Stewart and his way to bring it to the attention of Congress, there never would have been a change in policy on that. Well, let me point out that the Agent Orange thing, which was an abomination, we, we finally got through on that because of a guy, a wonderful guy, a great hero named Robert Alvarez. And Bob Alvarez was in a, 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 a chief aide to Senator John Glenn. And it was only because of Senator John Glenn and the hearings on Agent Orange that we were finally able to get recognition of the, of the fact that our, the, our Viet, guys in Vietnam were poisoned by Agent Orange, and they and their children had horrible medical problems that the government would not, you know, tooth and nail would not acknowledge. There's another one you've missed, Jerry, which goes way back when, which is Atomic Veterans. After um, World War II, the, the U.S. military conducted, as we all know, uh, hundreds of tests in the atmosphere on land, and especially in the South Pacific and Nevada, of nuclear bombs. And in many cases, I mean, the pinnacle of insanity, uh, the, the military surrounded nuclear bomb tests in Nevada with living guys. I mean, guys in the military and then marched them right through ground zero to see if they'd fall over dead. Hard for me to not use the F word here. And, and you know, tens of thousands of veterans were poisoned by radiation from the atomic tests, which the government would absolutely not acknowledge. And they wouldn't even acknowledge people who were at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A lot of American military went into Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the bombing, got sick from the radiation, and the military would not acknowledge it. So here we have another instance that you might want to put in the repertoire there. Well, uh, I live in a, in a 65, 55-plus community. And just down the street from me is an atomic veteran, and he's still fighting that case. So outrageous! I, it is outrageous. Now let me give you a couple of things, and I'll circle back. Well, to let me very quickly. I did write a book about this with Bob Alvarez and Norman Solomon called "Killing Our Own," and it's free on the internet. And I will put put the link in the, the name in the chat. It's easy to find, and you may want to look at our chapters uh, on atomic veterans because it's, it's a horrendous story. Completely infuriating. We're talking with Jerry Ashton, by the way. He's going to have to go in a few minutes. But Jerry has done the incredible job of, uh, of founding this uh, uh, organization that has now uh, uh, retired $11 billion in medical debt. And if you get New Jersey and, and um, Connecticut to sign on, 
as apparently you've done in New York City. That's a really big deal. Well, let me circle back to your question. Is there anybody else who's doing what RIP Medical Dent does? And the answer now is yes, me. <laughs> I, re okay. I, retired, I retired to the board of RIP Medical Dent to start the process of building a new charity. But this charity is veteran-centered. Because when I found out in my experience with RIP that all the debt that I wanted to get was in the VA, I couldn't buy it. So I decided I would retire from working with, I retired to the board, still active, but I decided to retire and start a charity. I put it in the in the uh, chat. It's called endveterandebt.org. And also for information purposes, I put in another one where I want you guys to go and sign. It's called endveteran, uh, endveteranmedicaldebt.com. And my job now is to hunt down the VA, <laughs> hunt down every form of veteran debt that's that's created, and not just medical debt, but every debt. So I'm a kind wow. of busy guy. It's unbelievable. It's amazing stuff, Jerry. We're really uh, grateful to have you on. I hope everybody, uh, uh, you know, this is something we can all do. So if I send you a hundred bucks, how many, uh, how much debt can you retire? If you send RIP medical debt. 100 bucks, they will be able to charge uh, 100 times that. So what is that? $1,000, right? No. You, you, you give me $1,000. 100 times 100 is 10,000, isn't it? Is that correct? Yeah. If How many zeros take, are we talking about? 100 times 100 what, that's, is that's four zeros. That's what happens. Two zeros, 10,000, two zeros. Yeah, it's 10 grand. 10 grand. If I send you $100, you can retire $10,000 in medical debt. Is that right? That's correct. If you give me $10,000... I can retire a million dollars worth of medical debt. Wow. That's amazing. Really now, amazing. Going, Paul Newman, going, are you raising like, your hand? Paul Newman, are you? No. Okay. Justin? Justin uh, LeBlanc, go ahead, Justin. Uh, I'd like Dr. Nancy to weigh in first, and then I'll give mine. Okay. Oh, Nancy, you had your hand up. Go ahead, please. Because uh, Jerry's going to have to leave, but Nancy is a medical doctor who's going to give us a presentation on, on Medicare for All. Go ahead, Nancy. You've just educated me. No, I don't really... I, I wanted you to comment on my slide on this, but I've always thought of the Veteran Administration as a socialist um, medical system, and I'm disappointed to under to hear it's not perfect. No, I really want, in fact, let me put my email in here. I want you guys to get in touch with me um, to discuss what can be done. Uh, All right. And there are so many ways we can we can slaughter it's, this. I hog. see it. Gary at endveterandebt.org. Yes, okay. thank you. Justin, you have a question? So uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison uh, filed a lawsuit that's kind of in parallel to this sort of thing. Uh, and it was originally done uh, in the style against the cigarette companies for their abuses of health and lying about it. Uh, but yep. his is a RICO type lawsuit against the oil companies and their lies about climate change and also the health effects such as asthma. Yep. And of course that contributes to this medical debt. But I wanted to say that the problem has become so big that the uh, big credit reporting agencies have come to realize that even when people can't pay the hospitals or won't pay the hospitals, they'll still keep paying their other bills. So we're actually responsible consumers and they're even talking about stopping the credit hits for uh, medical debt collection. Have you heard well, of anything like this? They didn't volunteer this. We were behind the drive to get these people to pay attention. That credit reports. By the way, when we abolish somebody's medical debt, we take off the credit mark too. That that gives them the freedom to be able to use that money for better purposes and rent that house, um, you know, buy that car, get those tires on credit without being abused. <laughs> wow. That is really great stuff. Um, uh, uh, Dave Salman, um, uh, are you with us, Dave? Uh, I wanted to jump in and tell Jerry and Nancy about the story of your sister here. Um, yeah, there you are. Dave Salman, tell us what happened to your, your sister. It's mind-boggling. Well, this just shows you how, can you hear me? Uh, there I am. Yeah. This just shows you how you never know. So uh, a few days ago, uh, my sister lives in San Francisco. And uh, you guys all remember, I'm sure, that a few days ago, there were these big, massive rainstorms, 90-mile-an-hour winds blowing in San Francisco. So she's about six blocks from her house, 
on 18th and Castro, and her her husband uh, goes into some uh, cafe to to use the bathroom, and she's just standing out there on the street waiting for him to come out, and suddenly she is felled by a, a giant tree that is blown over and smashed her in the back, breaking her hip, breaking mm. her breaking her her two vertebrae and she was com- completely you know taken by surprise and lucky she wasn't killed uh you know i we did some research on this and most people who have trees fall on them are killed and uh she's in the she went to the er and so on she survived um she's she's in a lot of pain and all this um i i, I actually i'm going to check on her She was a union uh, member all her life. My sister was one of the first women in the trades. She was a carpenter and then a, uh, I have to brag about her a little bit. Her her last job before she retired was she was in charge of the renovation of the Fairmont Hotel on Nava Hill. My my beautiful little sister with her earrings and 500 hard hats working for her. (laughs) She was telling them all what to do and she knew the job perfectly. And then she built the Exploratorium in the bay and then retired so she's doing great and the fairmont, uh, the fairmont was my my um honeymoon location so. oh my god <laughs> well she knows the place inside and out she's great to travel through san francisco she says like oh yeah i earthquake proof that building and well that's a frank lloyd wright house i renovated that you know it's pretty great anyway i i'm gonna check on her insurance i think she's covered by union is this the kind of thing the Carpenters Union? Okay. Got to go. Oh, okay. All right, Jerry, we're going to resume this. You come back. Uh, it's You're one of our most impressive um, uh, uh, presenters. Of, uh, we've had 47 people listening to you, been live streamed. So we'll have you back. Well, okay. thank you so give much. Best, give, give thank best. you, Jerry. Thank, thank you, you guys. Jerry. Okay, so we're going to continue. It's now 3 o'clock Pacific time, 6 o'clock Eastern time. Dave, the question becomes, do you have, uh, does she have health insurance and will it cover it? I mean, my, when my parents in their 70s, uh, they were healthy all their life until the last year. They must have run up a million dollars in, in medical bills in their last year of life. Right. And my mother's mantra was, thank God for Medicare. If it hadn't been for Medicare, I could never have owned a house or put my kids through school. And that would have never happened because we'd have to assume their medical debt. Yeah, Medicare. So I hope- Medicare has its issues, but it's it's better than nothing, that's for sure. And uh, I, I think my sister's covered by the Carpenters Union, but now that you're asking me, I don't really know about Medicare in her case. I'll find out. Okay, well, Myla has a hand, and then we're going to go to Dr. Nancy and the Parco. Yeah, uh, David. To talk, uh, give, oh, go ahead, Myla. David, oh, my God. I know. What a story. It's so I mean, random. Had, the random. So gl- yeah, I'm so glad she survived, but. Me too. It was the tree, I mean, the the city of San Francisco should be responsible for the medical. We're thinking that we, uh, we, there's, we have a picture of the tree. Apparently there's a video, some some uh-huh. traffic video or something caught the thing. And she's thinking about a lawsuit. I don't know. My, but if, if, the, if it was on city property, then the city. It was, it was on a sidewalk. And apparently what you can see from the, from the um, picture is, the roots were completely rotted out. So that tree should not have been standing there. So the right. liability has to be with the city of San Francisco. I'm glad to hear to that be. because I think and not only and not only million. should they not only should they be paying for her medical debt, but they should also be paying for her pain and suffering. Her and, pain is and, excruciating. And really, seriously, she should be taken care of for the rest of her life. Yeah. Based on this, and the city is definitely liable. I'm not a lawyer, right? But I play one on TV and on grief calls, and um, it, on city property, roots rotted out. It's got to be the city's liability. I think you're. I think you're right. Um, you know, we tend to okay. like to avoid litigation, but uh, this seems like a, a pretty yeah. yeah. So a pretty clear. Thank you, David. That's a horrible story, and, and I, um, I hope you'll keep us posted. You can. We'll have to. We'll have to yeah, talk to you send a sometime. prayer to her. She's a great person. Her name is Nina, mm. and uh, she deserves everybody's everybody's goodwill. Yeah. Well, someone, uh, thank you so much, David. Keep with us, please. Uh, someone who also deserves our goodwill is Dr. Nancy Naparco. 
Um, she's a close friend. And uh, also, you know, our Super Bowl uh, was a few weeks ago when the University of Michigan won the national championship. And um, we've been waiting for 50 years for that one. Uh, but Nancy is also a truly great um, um, uh, healer. And um, she's been asking and will now we can finally offer her the opportunity to give us a presentation on universal health care and single payer. So, Nancy, the uh, the floor is yours. We have 45 people with us and um, and take it away. Now, remember, our, we're also on radio, so we'll utilize your slides, but may, make sure that our radio audience can understand what you're talking about. Whoops. You're good. OK, this is me. I am recently responsible for trying to uh, re um, organize a L.A. area. Uh, Physicians for National Health Program. And that's where this came from. Um, I've got a lot of, I'm trying to, there, now I can see my own screen. Um, corporate, and, and this is going to be um, very simple for some people who are really into it, but I think it emphasizes why this is important. Uh, I love to say markets are great for vegetables, but not healthcare. And that's the direction we've been going to for 30 years. Um Oops. The U.S. is the only developed nation that does not provide comprehensive health care for all 28 million are uninsured in 2022. Um, many don't have care because of high deductibles, limited providers, and a bunch of people die because of not having insurance. And this is actually directed toward doctors. My position is that I could tell you plenty of my own as well as my patients horrible stories about medical debt, um, but doctors have heard it all. There are other more objective reasons for single payer. In 2008, uh, most doctors thought they were uh, against single payer, and now the majority are actually for. And I think the rest of them don't know. In fact, in the United States, we have a higher infant mortality than all the other developed nations. And even wealthy white Americans have a higher infant mortality than these other countries. So it's not just the poor and the people of color. And this really blows me away. Among 100,000 live births, babies born, 33 American ladies die. Compared to all these other nations, out of 100,000, only 11 to 2 will die. And in fact, life expectancy is lower in the United States than all these other countries. It's fallen to 77 compared to 80s for everybody else. Two thirds of bankruptcy uh, um, files cite medical bills or illness related work loss. You catch the rest of the show at grassrootcc.org.